Hello and welcome back to the wonderful world of chemistry. Uh, today we are looking at chlorine. Okay, so linking back to the specification references, we're going to be looking at today, yes, the continuation of uh, how we actually get it from the sea and the processes involved with that. But in addition to that, we're going to start looking at little bits of green chemistry in a bit more detail. So we're going to have a look today at atom economy. So if you want a title for today's lesson, here it is, it's getting chlorine the old way. Um, there's, the, there's a reason it's the old way. Just like with the last few halogens, what we're going to do is start by thinking about what do we actually know about them in the first place? So what do you already know about chlorine? What are its uses? What does it look like in aqueous solutions or in organic solutions? Has it got a high melting point, boiling point? What's its reactivity like? For those of you who I see on webinar, we'll go through this in the webinar. Now, this may seem like a bit of a jump. We've gone from talking about chlorine to talking about an alkali. Strange, I know, but actually the chlorine industry and the alkali industry are so closely entwined that actually a lot of times industrial chemists call it the chloralkali industry. So what we're going to start by looking at is actually how alkalis were first extracted. And then from that, we will see that chlorine, well, I'll not spoil it yet. So what uses do you know for the alkalis? So I warned you, we're back to France. Très bien, merci beaucoup la Français. Uh, in France, they had their industrial revolution in the sort of 1700s. And a big part of their industrial revolution was the glass blowing industry, okay? There was a lot of income and industry around glass blowing and the production of glassware containers, beakers, uh, vases, wine bottles. And one of the main ingredients that they need in the glass blowing industry, other than your silicates, which, you know, sand, glass, that makes sense. One of the process ingredients that you actually need is an alkali. So as the industry was absolutely booming, the supply of alkali was getting lower and lower as it was getting used up. So it was pretty important for the French to maintain their industrial revolution and the speed it was growing. They needed to find more alkali. So just like with the other halogens, there was a need and that need drove discovery. So they needed more alkalis. The scientists were set with the task of find us more alkalis, make us some alkalis somehow. And there was one person in particular who delivered. Nicolas Leblanc, Nicolas Leblanc, Leblanc, if you want to just pronounce it boring in English. Uh, and he was a French chemist, une homme de chimie. And he invented a way of getting alkalis from salt, and limestone. So there were three main reactants in the Leblanc process. Salt from the sea, limestone, just dig it out of the ground because it's rocks, and coal. During that time there wasn't such an aversion to coal as we have in our current day. Um, obviously these days we know as a fossil fuel it is non-renewable uh, and there are emissions associated with it, but that then they weren't really aware of that. So for each one of these, um, a little task for you to think about, where each reactant comes from and is it a renewable resource? Okay, salt. Uh, where each reactant comes from, salt came from the sea um, and with coastal sort of places, that's really easy to get hold of. So the closer you are to the sea, the easier it is gonna be for you to do that and cheaper too. Is salt renewable? Uh, pretty renewable, yeah, because the processes that make the sea salty are kind of ongoing, so that's pretty renewable. Limestone, where does it come from? Um, rocks. Uh, England in particular, we have got quite a lot of limestone. Um, limestone is formed. Limestone was originally formed from when uh, sea creatures fell to the bottom of the oceans, they decomposed, and the atoms sort of uh, calcified, stuck together, and formed uh, the rocks. So, for example, calcium carbonate. So, anywhere where millions of years ago it was under the sea, um, there's pretty much guaranteed to be limestone. So, millions of years ago, uh, Britain, France, a lot of Europe was still under the sea. There are fairly rich deposits of limestone 
all over Europe. Is it renewable? Um, the rock cycle, it takes a long time uh, to replenish these things, so it's not quickly renewable. However, it's definitely in plentiful supply. And coal. We know today that coal is a non-renewable resource uh, that is associated with a lot of bad emissions. Um, but back then they didn't necessarily know that. So looking at the LeBlanc process just from a raw materials point of view of things coming in, it's looking pretty good. All three of those are pretty readily available at that point in history. And two out of the three, even by modern day standards, are really easy to get hold of. Pretty decent reactants there. They're pretty easy to come by and quite cheap, especially if you live by the coast. What's not to like about this process? Initially, this was thought to be a very successful process. So much so, different pockets of alkali industry grew up around different places in Europe. One area in England that's quite famous for its chloralkali industry is Witness. Witness is up uh, near Chester and Liverpool, that sort of area. Mr. Bateson was always talking about Witness, and he's from that area originally, okay? So, northwest of England, chloralkali industry, they were doing pretty well for themselves. They were getting money coming in, renewable resources, it's by the coast. Job done. Thank you, I will take your money. There you go, the French people. You take your alkali, we'll take your money. Can anyone predict a downside yet? Ouch, there, there it is. Uh, so this process came about in 1794 um, and this is witness in 1895. Um, doesn't look particularly appealing, does it? Don't wanna go there for some fresh air really, do you? One of the big problems with the LeBlanc process is, as you can see here, it's massively polluting. Not only is it massively polluting, it is massively wasteful. So just wrap your mind around this. In 1862, nearly 2 million tonnes of raw materials were used to produce just a quarter of a million tonnes of product. 2 million tonnes, reactants going in, a quarter of a million tonne product. The rest of that is waste. That is not good. That is not efficient use of the chemicals that you have there. And as we can see here, actually the inputs there, we said the salt was probably the best bit of it. So very renewable, very easy to get hold of, job done. Um, that was the raw material that was used the least. So only one tonne of salt was used for three tonnes of coal, where the coal was the raw material that we liked the least. So what I'm gonna do, we're gonna sketch out this process. Um, now, now this process is not a requirement on your course, okay? This is just to show you where we started from and then where we're gonna to go to. This is extremely unlikely to be on any exams. However, as we've said before, what may be on the exams is your interpretation of a process, of an industrial process, and being able to evaluate it in terms of green chemistry. So inputs, here we go. We've got salt, so sodium chloride extracted from the sea, and sulfuric acid from what we call pyrites, which are just kind of rocks again. Those are mixed together, they're heated. We get two outputs at this point. We've got something that they call salt cake or sodium sulfide, and a waste product here on the right hand side of hydrogen chloride gas. Now I've highlighted it in red because it's a waste product, um, but highlighting it in red's a good idea. That's pretty dangerous, okay? Hydrogen chloride gas. That's basically hydrochloric acid as a gas. Would you really want to breathe in hydrochloric acid gas? I think not. From there, the salt cake is processed further by adding loads of coal, and a decent bit of limestone. At this point, we get a few different things happening. We get some solid waste called calcium sulfide. Now the calcium sulfide decomposes to give off hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, that's the uh, one of the main smells that they put in stink bombs, okay? Anything with sulfur in tends to stink, stink of rotting eggs in particular, not pleasant at all. But at the bottom here, we have got our alkali. So soda ash, it was called, but its chemical name is actually sodium carbonate. So as you can see just from this diagram, we have got 
one, two, three, four inputs going in there and three outputs that are harmful and only one output that is actually useful. This is not a good process. And it's not a good process in terms of something that we call atom economy. So what I'd like you to do at this point is, students from my school, you need to have a go at Elements from the Sea 6.1, Calculating Atom Economy. OK, let's carry on the story of the alkali industry. So again, nearly 100 years after the process was first invented by uh, Leblanc, by 1891, over 200 hectares around Widnes were buried under an average of four metres of solid waste. So double the height of me. Not that that helps because I'm sat down. Uh, deep, very deep. Um, not only that, so there was all this manky solid waste that they just basically chucked on fields and just got rid of like that. Hydrogen chloride was coming out of the top of the factories. So again, that will dissolve into bodies of water and start forming acid rain. Bad times. And then in addition to that, some of the solid waste actually decomposed, as we saw labelled in the process from before, to form hydrogen sulphide, which again, stinks to high hell. And sulphur, not forgetting in specific forms, if sulphur gets in waterways, that again can evaporate and then lead to the further acid rain. So there was a serious problem in Widnes and these other chloralkali industry areas of really quite nasty pollution. And one of the really awful things about uh, acid rain in particular is because the acid rain in the water cycle it's not necessarily limited just to the one location. So the emissions from these factories could go evaporate up into the clouds. The clouds moved on and the acid rain fell in different places. For example, I, I saw a case study about tracking of pollution. Um, if I can find references to it, I'll pop it in the notes at the end of this video, um, where acid rain from our industrial revolution in England um, was blown away and up to um, Denmark and all the Danish forests got that acid rain on them and it did some really serious damage. So around this time, um, the governments, not necessarily, but the people were not particularly happy about this. They were getting lots of pollution and it just wasn't a nice place to live at all. So there became a demand to sort this out. Now the government at that point was extremely slow to respond. Any ideas why that might have been? But eventually, in 1863, the Alkali Act did come around and it started to limit the emissions of hydrogen chloride gas, which is a great idea. And as you can see from this diagram here, it's as simple as putting a little bit of water down the chimney. The guy that came up with this was called William Gossard, um, again, I've gone French with my pronunciations there, Gossage. I'm not sure if he was French at all. Go do some research, find out and let me know. Uh, and all that he did, as I say, is just put water down the chimneys, the water combined with the hydrogen chloride and it formed hydrochloric acid. Which, yeah, you're thinking, okay, brilliant, they've made hydrochloric acid. You can now send that off to be made into something else and contribute to chemical processes. No. At this point, they just put it down the drains, which again lead to the acidification of the waterways, which when it evaporated led to acid rain, acid rain that fell in our area and other areas and was just very harmful, not good. It wasn't until about 10 years later that another scientist, Henry Deacon, started looking at a way to actually use this properly and not chuck it down the drain. So. What Deacon did is the hydrogen chloride gas was not allowed to escape out the chimney as it had been initially. It was not wasted by washing it down the drain. What he did instead is he oxidised it. When he oxidised it, it forced it to become chlorine in its elemental form. So that is why we've been talking about this process. We were supposed to be talking about how do we get chlorine. This was a way of getting chlorine. So the Leblanc process was... Troublesome, to say the least. Yes, it achieved the goal of making alkalis, but at a very high environmental cost. 
both Deacon and Gossage. Their process has helped improve this, um, but actually we did need a whole new way of getting both alkalis and our chlorine. So that was witnessed in 1895, even after the Alkali Acts came into force. But this picture here is witness in 2010. And as you can see there, it looks much nicer. How we got from this to this is our next lesson, in which we'll talk about the new process and the process that is used today to extract chlorine. To round this lesson off, what you need to do is answer the following questions. Okay, ladies, gents, girls, boys and others, that is it for now. That is our journey through the chlorine and the alkali, the chloralkali industry. Um, next time, we'll be talking about the modern way of getting chlorine. And as you'll see, it's significantly better, but still not without its problems. Tasks for you to complete relating to these lessons are ensure in your notes that you've got as many uses of chlorine listed as possible that you have completed the worksheet on atom economy and answer the questions on the last slide of the PowerPoint. This content will be reviewed via webinar for my students in our next session together. And that'll do it for today, ladies, gents, girls, boys and others. Keep well.